today for... it's like i don't know if you can see it or not but it is raining it's very gloomy outside today uh the rain just won't stop it's a heck of a way to start 2021 because it's been raining today i'm going to be talking about another black widow of sorts i've told a couple of these stories in the past there was one that was in aniston and then again in montgomery now this story today is about Ann Jeanette lyles from here in georgia she was never officially called a black widow but her story kind of lines up with those who are named after that deadly spider Okay, so uh, these women, they are referred to as Black Widows because the Black Widow spider, it is a female spider who often kills and eats their partners after mating or eating, which typically lines up with the actions of these women uh, from these stories, minus the eating their partner heart but you know who knows i guess even that could happen too but that's why they call them black widows because the black widow spider does the same thing in the 1940s there was a building that actually set right here that you see that there's there's an alleyway here where that fence is there was a building sitting there on the bottom floor of that building there was a diner it was called Lyle's Diner, to be precise. And it was and it was owned by a man named Benjamin Franklin Lyles Jr. Uh, now, if you look at one of those old pictures from the day, you can see that all these buildings actually are, uh, well, fairly still the same. This building was white at the time, and it said office supplies going right across here. But the building still looks the same. So does this one down here. And if you look close in that shot, you can even see... The third window from the end is much larger than the rest of them for some reason. And it was the same way in the 40s and 50s during this time period we're talking about. This building over here was there at the time, but I think it was a lighter color. But everything was still the same. It all looked the same. It just right here, there was a building that has now been torn down. And over here to the right of it was that diner, Lyle's Diner. One day inside of the diner a new waitress started working her name was ann jet and jet was uh for the time period someone that they thought was very attractive and she was very sweet and she knew how to talk to people right here we're in the heart of macon the over here this was the police station at one time uh the the courthouses and stuff are just right around the corner here so this diner served a lot of the lawyers and judges and police officers all every day they would all come here and uh get lunch or dinner and jet and ben franklin would go on to get married in 1948 she continued working in the diner she was actually like the the guys all the men who who worked at the courthouse and stuff they always said that she was their favorite because of her charismatic personality and just that that she was really beautiful from the outside, Anjet's life appeared to be filled with rainbows and marshmallows. The truth of the matter was, it was all a lie. Life at home for Anjet was, uh, well, it, it was filled with bitter arguing between her and her husband, Ben. Police were called multiple times to their residence and here to the restaurant because of their arguing as Ben's health started failing. He began experiencing extreme fatigue, nausea, diarrhea, and severe stomach pain. None of them could figure out what was wrong with him. He was prescribed several medications. None of them worked. He just continued to grow more and more frail. It came to a time where Ben had gotten so sick that he sold Lyle's Diner without telling anyone. Now, he, he was the legal owner of it. He had, had actually inherited it from his father, but he didn't tell anyone. He didn't talk to anyone prior to, he didn't even talk to Anjet 
about it prior to. And that was like one of her favorite things to do. She loved working in the diner. She absolutely loved it. She cherished working there more than anything else. So when he finally told her that he had sold the property that used to sit there, she was infuriated. Man, she was mad. She never, ever forgave Ben Franklin Lyles Jr. for selling her beloved restaurant. After the restaurant was gone, the doctors, they continued trying to figure out what was wrong with Ben, but they, they never could come up with any kind of solution. Nothing made sense about it. So he was admitted to the hospital here in Macon, which is only about two blocks over on the other side of these buildings here. Um, he was admitted into the hospital here and subjected to a battery of testing. But while right in the middle of all that testing, Ben Franklin Lyles Jr. succumbed to this mysterious illness. He died without them ever knowing what his real cause of death was. They had no clue. They just declared it encephalitis, but they ultimately knew that that really wasn't why he passed. So with Ben gone, and Jeanette moved into her parents' house with her daughters. She began saving every penny that she could. She worked as a, a waitress in multiple different restaurants at, at the same time. She, she uh, held two and three jobs at one time as a waitress and saved every penny she could. She took every penny she could from her family. And in April of 1955, Jeanette once again purchased the diner sitting here on this property she made enough money to buy back the restaurant that she felt like ben had stolen from her the diner was renamed in jets and it quickly became the hottest restaurant in macon it's set right here in the heart of downtown macon the uh terminal station is right down here at the end of this road the courthouse over here to our left I mean this was a busy part of town and it it was the hottest place in town to come eat she was making tons of money hand over fist uh, living here in the south there in those times basically church outranked everything that's why the area is commonly referred to as the Bible Bill and yet was scrutinized because it she's she liked black magic and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, so she would frequently talk about casting spells and going to fortune tellers. It was very common place for the customers of her diner to witness her burning candles and speaking to the flames of those candles. But the food was just so darn good. The gossip was even better. So the patrons, they all looked the other way. For a little while, anyways. In May of 1955, Anjet began dating a new man, Joel Neal Gabbert. No, he was known as Buddy. Uh, he was a pilot for Capital Airlines. Now, Capital is no longer in service. Capital merged with United, and it all became one airline, United Airlines. They flew to New Mexico and got married only a month after they began dating, and Soon after that surprise elopement, Buddy went in to the hospital. He developed a high fever and a rash. Just as with Ben, doctors were unable to diagnose what was wrong with him. Buddy continued to grow more and more sick until he passed away in December of 1955. After Buddy's death, and Jet cashed in his life insurance policy. She would go on to buy a new car. She bought a new home and went all out with new clothes and shoes and jewelry. And Jet has actually published uh, cookbooks. There's cookbooks out there you can find with some of the recipes that she used to cook and serve out of her diner. They used to set right here. Uh, you can find those online if you're interested in making any of this serial killer's feast. Now, Anjette was still working long hours here at the restaurant while trying to single-handedly raise two daughters. Her mother-in-law, Julia Lyles, offered to move in and help her out, and Anjette accepted. 
while Julia and Anjet were living together, Anjet came across one of Julia's bank statements indicating that the elderly Mrs. Lyles was very well off financially. Anjet became adamant that her mother-in-law make a will, but Mrs. Lyles was very superstitious, was very superstitious, and she refused to make a will. She didn't want to do that. So in August of 1957, the elder Mrs. Lyles became very ill with the same sickness as her son and Ben Pryor. Mrs. Lyles passed away on September the 29th of 1957. The doctors chalked it up to old age, to symptoms of being old, even though she was only 60 at the time of her death. A week later, after Mrs. Lyle's passing, Injet produced a will she claimed that her late mother-in-law wrote, leaving her everything in Mrs. Lyle's estate. No one questioned the document. The will was quickly probated, and Injet received everything. So with Ben's death, she received a small amount of life insurance. Then she got an even larger amount of life insurance with her second husband, Buddy. And now she had inherited a sizable estate from her mother-in-law. Look at that. It just, the bottom fell out real quick. The people here of Macon, they had looked the opposite direction many times when it came to Anjet. But this would not be the case when it come to the death of her oldest daughter, Marsha. In the winter of 1958, after an extensive hospital stay, nine-year-old Marsha Elaine Lyles passed away April the 4th of 1958. The people here in Macon had explained away the deaths of her two husbands and her mother-in-law. They, they, basically they thought of it as her having a string of bad, man, look at this rain. Oh my goodness. Crap. And we're stuck out here in the middle of downtown in it. Oh, that's horrible. At any rate, they explained it away as Anjet having bad luck. They weren't as willing to accept that, though, when it came to Marsha. The, the death of a child always hits people very hard. And Marsha had been healthy, completely healthy, up until the last month of her life. They knew something had to be up. And their intuition was right, because Marsha was the only one of those three that they did an autopsy on. And her autopsy revealed massive, I mean, absolutely massive amounts of arsenic in her system. So, as part of an investigation by the Macon Police Department, prosecutors obtained a court order to exhume the bodies of Ben Lyles and Buddy Gabbert and Julia Lyles. Autopsies of this trio revealed that they too had massive amounts of arsenic in their systems. Police then went to the home of Injet Lyles. They confiscated several boxes of arsenic-based ant poisoning, along with what was referred to as voodoo paraphernalia. Candles, written spells, potions and powders, and uh, even tree roots. The woman who had made her local claim to fame with her food and her flirts here at the diner, she was about to become a national celebrity, but not for the food, not for her cooking, for something more sinister. Injet was arrested on May the 6th of 1958, and she was charged with four counts of murder. The media just couldn't get enough of this pretty young woman who was charged with murdering four of her closest loved ones, especially uh, including her own child. It was just simply unheard of. So the first week of October in 1958, Injet Lyles went on trial. For a week, witnesses took the stand and testified to seeing Injet serve her daughter and her mother-in-law and her second husband drinks and food during their hospitalization. 
They also question in Jets about why she purchased a casket for her daughter two weeks before her daughter even died. And they questioned her about a uh, confiscated piece of paper where Julia Lyle's name was written repeatedly. And then they questioned her uh, about pieces of paper they found in the trash that appeared to be the, the where someone was forging the wheel of Julia Lyle's. Someone had was was writing it, and then they'd mess up, so they'd throw it away, and then write it again, and it, you know those kind of things. The very last day of the trial, just before they made closing arguments, and Jet took the stand as an unsworn witness, which meant uh, she couldn't be cross-examined. So she looked directly at the jury of twelve men, and she said, "Gentlemen of the jury, I have not killed anyone." The jury didn't believe her, obviously as it took them only one hour of deliberating to find Jet guilty of all four of the murders. Then immediately following that guilty verdict, the judge sentenced her to death, making her the first white woman in the state of Georgia to be sentenced to die in the electric chair. Now, of course, everyone gets their appeal process, so Jet began that process, and during which time she suddenly found religion while in prison. When that didn't work, her second appeal was different. She began to act insane and started requesting to meet with psychiatrists. Those theatrics had no effect either. Georgia, they really weren't ready to execute a woman just yet. So really, uh, Anjet spent very little time on death row before she was permitted a hearing before the Board of Pardons and Paroles, Injet claimed that her late mother-in-law was guilty of killing her own son, Injet's second husband, Buddy, and she killed herself. Injet then accused her own mother, Jetta Donovan, who had stood by Injet throughout the entire ordeal. She accused her of killing little Marsha. Uh, again, Georgia wasn't really ready to execute the first woman. So they labeled Anjet as a chronic paranoid schizophrenic and they sent her to the state mental hospital in, at Milledgeville here in, not for about half an hour away from Macon. The stipulation was though that if she were to recover, meaning if the public outrage threatened certain re-elections for certain politicians or executing a woman suddenly became the right thing to do, I guess, and Jet would be returned to death row. It actually may, that, that, you know, that crazy lie may have actually, you know, uh, saved her from being executed by the state. Because she stayed in Milledgeville for almost 20 years. And then at the age of 52, and Jet Lyles passed away of a heart attack, still inside the mental hospital, uh, in a karma-related final twist on and Jet's life. It's, uh, it's a crazy story. At any rate, that's going to do it for this episode today from here in Macon. I'm going to go get in out of the rain. I want to thank you all so much for watching. I really appreciate it. If you're new here, go down, click that subscribe button. Take it a step further. Hit that notification bell icon. That way you get notified every time I upload a video. If you want to help support the channel, check out the links down in the description box below. This, I just want to thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. I'll see you again tomorrow. Stay safe and stay healthy.